You've lived a great life and done well for yourself. But what mark will you leave on the world? How will you inspire future generations? Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand have helped thousands of people answer exactly those questions. If you've ever wondered, what will be my legacy? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Stan and Katie Beth. Welcome back to the show. You are listening to the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Today, we have Patricia DeFonte. Patricia, welcome to the show. It is so nice to be here. Thank you for giving a platform to nerd out about something I love so much. Fantastic. We have lots and lots of exciting things to talk about today. We have a lot of areas in common that we're passionate about. But before we jump into that, I'd like for you to tell our listeners a little bit about how you got started in this industry. Sure. So I've been a lawyer for about 20 years, but not always an estate planning lawyer. I was an intellectual property and entertainment lawyer for a long time. Uh, but then I had some kids and I can't go to shows at night anymore. I can't wait for my clients to wake up at 11 o'clock in the morning anymore. So I found estate planning through a combination of terrible things happening to people I really love that didn't have the right documents in place. And um, a really close friend who is in this practice area who has a wonderful quality of life, cares deeply, is very emotionally and intellectually satisfied as an attorney. And so that just became very attractive to me that I could solve a problem while actually being a happy whole person myself. That's fantastic. So I was intrigued on your website. You said your goal is to preserve family harmony, empower heirs, and thoughtfully reflect your clients' values. That's everything we love to hear. So tell us a little bit about your unique strategies and things that you do to achieve that. Absolutely. I think that there's no such thing as starter estate planning. I think that quote unquote basic estate planning, can I just get the bare bones, is kind of nonsense because okay, we're all going to die, right? 100% chance of death. The scary thing is we don't know when that is going to happen. And if that happens when the only thing that you own is your house, or you don't think you yet qualify for a big life insurance policy, or you don't think you needed all this stuff, the people on the receiving end of your basic planning will suffer and they will suffer greatly regardless of how much stuff you had. I think it's really important. Sometimes we're the only lawyers that the client ever sees, the only lawyers that clients are ever going to work with. And there's always the danger that no matter how often we tell them, state planning is not a one and done. I want to see you every three years, care and maintenance, care and maintenance. That first contact with a new client, creating the most robust personalized plan that you possibly can, because this may be the only time that they do it. And sure, maybe when they die, there's nothing in that trust. But if we've drafted it properly, and if we're lucky with the jurisdiction they're in, they can petition the court, get that stuff into the trust, and ultimately really protect the people that they created all of this for. And if it's not elegantly written, if it doesn't have all of the pressure release valves for us, successor trustee, if it doesn't have all of the protecting and protective scaffolding and provisions around a beneficiary, it's not sustainable. It's not going to work. And so these bare bones, oh, well, as long as the house gets in there and everybody gets their stuff as soon as I die and we don't have to worry about anybody being in jail or going through a divorce or not having any money. I don't know. I just feel like we never know what other people are going to do. And so I like to draft a trust that assumes all of the worst things, but present it in the most loving, encompassing, embracing language that we possibly can use as lawyers. Fantastic. Stan, I know you have a hundred questions. Why don't you um, ask, ask a few for Patricia? I know you've got a lot. Yeah, I love this. I would, I would love to be a fly on the wall and, and watch you, what you do an initial client interview. And so I'm curious, you've been doing this a while now. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that when you walk into that initial client meeting, you're in control of it and you have a strategy for how you approach this. Tell me how you handle that meeting. Absolutely. You know, clients think that because they've filled in some inta intake documents, they feel ready to tell you what's going to happen. You know, we made them fill in this asset sheet. 
and we made them fill in this document, you know, who's in charge of you bump your head? Who takes care of the assets when you die? And we don't use nomenclature on our intake documents. Just ask these questions. So the clients usually come in a little bit confident and um, <clears throat> they can get a little frustrated when they see that we're not looking at those documents, that they're way pushed off. When we were in person, way pushed off onto the side of the desk to make a point. Um, now on Zoom, they can't really see. Um, so I tell them, thank you so much for those intake documents. My team looked at them to make sure that you filled in all the boxes, but I have not read them yet. Just lady, God, so lazy. Um, and then we start with the questions. You know, I'll do the, every time you work with a lawyer, we owe you a series of duties so that they understand what the expectations are, that they can, what they can expect from me, what they can demand from me. I also need to set it up so that they know I owe them duties of loyalty and confidentiality. I can't tell anybody what we're talking about. We're gonna run into each other a hundred times in the Bay Area here in California. I'm, I'm only gonna wave at them from across the street. I would introduce them as my pals, my acquaintances, but they could introduce me as their estate planning lawyer, right? I need to give them that confidence they can talk to me. I need to warn them not to say things to me that they don't want the other one to hear. So we have to, you know, we have to set that table. And then I like to start asking them, you know, where did you meet? Tell me about your pets. Um, what organizations are you involved with? Get them talking about things that make them feel warm and happy. Um, here in California, it's fun to ask people, tell me about your gun collection. It's a big joke here because nobody has any. Um, so, you know, every lawyer has their little things that they ask. And then we start talking about, uh, then I'll generally do assets because people, before they want to tell you about their mom, they're really happy to go through that asset sheet that they gave you. And so I like to start um, with the softer things. And then it's, okay, tell me about your mom. Is she living? Is she still married? How's her health? How's she doing financially? Let's pull a copy of mom's deed. I see that it's not in a trust. Have you talked to mom about estate planning? Are you going to be her caretaker? So we're really digging into all of the family members because that's why I don't look at that intake form because it's meaningless because I don't know who these people are. Maybe I know that's your sister-in-law, but where does she live? Who's she married to? How many kids does she have? How intense is her job? Does she have her own stuff organized? What has she not told you that you think she made? You just like all the things. Um, we do that through parents, all siblings. Are there any other important family members? And sometimes we'll hear about auntie who helped raise me. I'm very close to these cousins. And then I want to hear about the inner circle. I want to take it a little bit wider. I want to step back and I want to know who do you love? Who are your main people? Um, and clients will say, well, why do you want to know that? I said, well, I need to know who you are. And this is a values-based proposition that we're doing. So just go with it. Who do you love? And then I like to say, you know, sometimes the people we love, they can't find their way out of a paper bag. So maybe it's a different list, but who do you trust? Who's responsible and reliable? And what I'm doing, and then I ask them, who are you worried about? Who makes you nervous? Who's come around when there's been a break in the family? Who stirs the pot? Who's the troublemaker? Who's weird around money? And then who do you feel responsible for? Do you pay for mom and dad to go on vacation? Are you worried about your sister going through a divorce? Like, what, how are you taking care of other people in the family? That's a big one. Um, and it, it might be the territory that I work in. I'm in California. We have a lot of people who live here who live in ways that their families back home can't even fathom. And they are spending a lot of money to take care of other people. They're putting the younger siblings through school. They are supplementing their grandparents' retirement incomes. They're doing all kinds of wonderful things with the huge amounts of money that they make. And so we talk a lot about that. Once we've gotten through that, um, I divert them into healthcare and I ask them if they want to be buried in a mushroom suit. It's important to dig in deep with advanced healthcare directives because, you know, I have to ask them, it's like, so you told me that Francine is a problem. Do we, we want to put in your healthcare directive that Francine can't be at the hospital because mm -hmm. she's going to cause problems. And then it starts clicking for them why I asked all those things. And let's talk about guardianship. And you really love these cousins of yours. Like you share values. They're so much fun. You're so connected to them. Um, did you list them as guardians? No, we thought we had to list our parents. Why? Just let your parents be grandparents. We can do whatever you like. Um, and it's after we've done that work, then we dig into, okay, so now you've bonked your head and your spouse, your partner, they've run off to Fiji. They've freaked out. So they're not around. Who is this trusted person for you? And now flip it. Who is that trusted person 
for the spouse because often the incapacity trustees, the agents under the durable power of attorney are very different than the death trustees. And then we talk about the death trustees, but maybe there's that administrative trust person, somebody who would love to bury their grief under a mountain of paperwork. And there are these people because they feel like they are contributing and that they're processing, but they need a big job. And so maybe there's that perfect person, right? Maybe that's your dad, that that would give him a sense of control, but you don't want him to ultimately be the distribution trustee. So then we'll talk about that. And, you know, do people who only have a house and a life insurance policy, do they need this level of planning? Yeah, they have a family that's just as complicated as everyone else's family. They're going to leave behind people that are going to suffer as much as rich people's people are going to suffer. And so it does take this in-depth conversation and these meetings take two hours. For a single person, maybe 90 minutes. For any couple married or unmarried, they take two hours. Um, and that's why I've never really talked about it that way other than to somebody on my team. Thanks for asking me. Yes, I love so it. So just so you know, this uh, I, I just made the decision about one minute ago that this this interview is going to be a training video for at, at our next uh, at, at the team meeting of my own law firm. Uh, you know, this this that initial meeting is just so crucial. It, uh, it's where where everything gets teed up, right? And so so that really has to be done right. It's that it, it's you know you have to create that safe place where the doors are closed. You don't take phone calls, you know, if, unless there's a fire in the building, they don't interrupt you. Yep. Uh, you really have to create the, the security that, so that people can really, truly be re really open. Uh, and uh, Stan, if I could, it's really yeah. important for that not to be the sales meeting. I will give somebody 20 minutes of my time for free. You interview me, I'll interview you. We're going to work together. Then that two hour meeting, that's a substantive meeting. It's a real meeting with your lawyer. You don't get to decide anything later. You have paid, you have signed the fee agreement, and we are working together. This is real work because it doesn't feel like a meeting with a lawyer for the client. It really doesn't. So what you're saying is, is that that initial meeting that you just walked through happens after you've had a previous meeting and you've worked out the financial arrangements? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. I don't want to talk about money in that meeting. I yeah. want to. And also, you know, for what I hear from other lawyers is that people don't always sign at the end of that meeting. They go, oh, great. And then they think about it. Absolutely not. I'm not giving somebody two hours of my time and my heart in that way. No, yeah. 20 minutes to vet each other. See how are we going to work together? My whole philosophy is on my website. I'm very transparent. Me, my team, you can learn a lot about us. I'm vetting them. I, every once in a while, I'll let the wrong person through, drive my team crazy. Um, but I'm pretty good at selection and being cautious. And I think that that first two hour meeting really needs to be about the client opening up and having faith in the process. So is the first meeting uh, live in person or is it, or is it uh, a live uh, virtual? I'm all on Zoom now. Really? It's all Zoom now. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yep. A big part of my client base is parents with babies. Babies can't be vaccinated yet. Pregnant ladies, they don't want to meet in person. And so we do everything on zoom including our notarizations are online safety first health first yep for sure so let me ask you when you know when when you get into the values discussion and this is beyond the who gets my stuff how do they get it um when you get into the values discussion how do you open the door to that so i've learned that i don't generally like to do it during the first meeting what i do is I have a template that I use. It's well, I draft with Wealth Council. I hope it's okay to say that. And I have a lot of extra phrases and clauses that I have added in. My list of advances, I think there are 25 now. And I tell the clients, I'm going to send you a laundry list because I want you to think about, I want you to see what other people have put forward as a value. And some of these things you're going to roll your eyes, and others you're going to say, oh, I would have forgotten. I, I didn't think of that. Um, and I like to go through that in depth during the document review meeting. And during the document review meeting, we review the healthcare directive and that's where we really push them more on, you know, well, what else? And what about religion? And what about keeping Francine out of the room and really push them to, to make it a really robust document. But also, especially with couples, I want to hear them say it so that if the time ever comes, they can say to their mother-in-law, oh, we had this crazy lawyer and we actually read these things to each other. And so I know 
to never pull the plug. Or I know mother-in-law that you got to get the hell out of here. She didn't want you in here. She wrote it down, whatever it is. Right. And then we'll go through the durable power of attorney, which is that it's such a big deal. And we really need to make sure they understand it because they're giving somebody a lot of authority. And then we go through the trust and I'll show them, you know, here's your statement of, of intent and why this is so important to you and your heart statement. And um, I have what, these beautiful well-being provisions that were written by Richard Franklin and other very talented estate planning attorney. And I, you know, I stole them because they're beautiful. <laughs> Once we get into the part of the trust that is the usually the descendants trust, and we start going through that really carefully. And that's when they start telling us things like, well, you know, when I was a kid, we went to Nicaragua every summer for a month. I said, well, why don't we put that in? Why don't we put that in, in the common trust? Because that's something that the trustee every year should make sure that the children, either grandma can come from Nicaragua or they're going there. If these relationships are important, let's start plugging more and more of that information in. Do you, you know, oh, you have pets. So let's talk about your pet and what that would look like because we don't want the trustee's hands to be tied if a child's pet gets sick we just want the pet to be okay so have you already created the, the trust document at this point we have and we it's absolutely it's a draft and we'll review that with the client and then we do this in real time and sometimes we tell the client get an hdmi cable from your computer into your tv so you can see this really really big because we can make changes in real time as we're going through the document Take so you'll out add these again. provisions. So mm -hmm. you'll add these provisions in real time while you're at, having yeah. the, the signing meeting. It's not a signing meeting. It's a document review meeting. Document the review whole purpose meeting. of the meeting is to review the documents. And um, what I like to do is overdraft. So I will throw in eight kitchen sinks, way too much stuff. I'll sometimes draft a gift three different ways, so that they can see: Do you want an outright distribution, Hems distribution, or you know? Know, well-being and comfort which way makes sense for this person because you told me about this person for three minutes last time we were together let's talk about this person again and here are the options because it doesn't it doesn't take me my it doesn't take my paralegal extra time really to do this and so i'd like to throw everything at them and then we can narrow it down and delete and delete and delete and delete and delete so when we send the documents to the client for review we tell them look at the parts in bright yellow that's where we want you to think don't try to understand the documents. We'll explain them to you. Right. So how many, I was counting meetings. So you have a meeting to get hired. And then 20 you have minutes. An initial meeting. Yep. Okay. Two and hours. I have the, the initial meetings, two hours. And I agree with you. I can't do it in less than two hours either. I feel like I'm, I'm cramming if I do. Then you have the document review meeting. 90 minutes. So, okay. And then how do the documents get signed? Um, we have all of our clients sign with notaries. And so I use a company that I know the owner, I see him in real life all the time. I've known him for years and they can either sign online at home in their pajamas, which they love because it only takes 10 minutes or they can sign in person. And we can also provide a witness here in California. If they sign online, we can't do the wills that way. And so we will send them the wills with a video and all these instructions on how to get those signed properly and returned to us. And we, there are timing requirements. So we really hound them and then we won't give them their documents until we get the pour over wills. And sometimes they get really mad. Well, I want to start funding my trust. Send me that certification of trust. I say, absolutely not. Cause I don't have your pour over will. <laughs> it's the only thing I can do to force it back. Yeah. And then there's one more meeting that we have to have, right? We have to have the funding meeting. We have to go through that asset sheet that they filled out line by line. We have to explain the certification of trust. We pull up their list of advisors that we obtain from them and say, we're going to send your homeowner's insurance, your house insurance person, the certification of trust to add the trust additional insured. We'll send your life insurance broker, the certification of trust, to change the beneficiary designation, your financial advisor, et cetera, et cetera, so that all of these people can be of support. And this is important for two things. It's important for the client because funding is overwhelming. And in my firm, they need to do it because if I do it, if anything changes, you know it's not going to get done. But if I put them through this meat grinder, they will absolutely remember that they have to do it. It's good for them because it forces them. If a bank is really mean to them, they can just break up with that bank and take their money elsewhere, right? Because if the bank's mean to you, what are they going to be like to your brother? They're going to be the worst. It's also really good for my firm. I talk to other professionals every week that I met because I sent them the certification of trust. And they say, Patricia, I've never gotten this from an estate planning lawyer ever. Who are you? 
So I am a person who knows how to use a CRM and knows how to communicate. This is effortless for me and my team, effortless. You press buttons and things get sent out. So there's no reason not to do it. And it, um, the clients love it. They feel very safe and that their advisors with permission know each other and know how to help each other to make everything go really smooth. So it sounds like you go way beyond just relying on Hegstead, right? I don't want to rely on Hegstead. It's expensive. And we don't know what a judge is going to do. What is a judge going to do? I don't know. Hegstead and Ugstead got lucky. I don't know what else is going to happen. And here in Northern California, the jurisdictions are really different. In San Francisco, right now, judges change, right? So who knows what's going to happen? I don't do this type of law, but my understanding is that in San Francisco, you better have it on the schedules. In San Mateo County, free for all. You don't even have to have schedules. It's just a given that we're just going to all let it all happen. But, you know, tides change. And so no matter who I work with in California, no matter where they're located, the schedule of assets is robust. We dig in there. We do. If Even if the client doesn't have cryptocurrency, we say cryptocurrency. Even if the client swears up and down they don't have intellectual property, intellectual property, including but not limited to, we take a, a really robust approach to that. And then our assignments are um, robust also. Yeah, and they might not be in California, right? I mean, they might move to Arizona, move to New York, you know, Colorado, whatever. They, yeah. they better not without talking to a local lawyer. Gosh, California, right. we've got crazy real estate laws and more community property. I don't know what goes on in those other states. Right. Some of you right. have your own inheritance tax and your own estate tax, all kinds of potholes to fall into. Yeah. yeah so move. you you also mentioned on your website, your goal is to help your clients in every way possible. So talk to us a little bit about how you involve insurance agents, CPAs, financial advisors, where do they, do you bring them in? Do you have your clients get them involved? Where do they fall in the pro in this process as you're working through? So it's a combination. We always ask the clients for a list of their advisors and then we go through it with them. Well, here's your insurance agent. When's the last time you talked to them? Never. Oh, you were assigned to them after your original person left, but those, that person never called you either. Well, if your homeowner's insurance broker is not calling you every year, here in the Bay Area, you're underinsured, period. You don't have umbrella insurance, that broker or agent is a hack. So we're gonna move you away from that, move you into something new. If they've done DIY, they're gonna have you know, insurance from Policy Genius or um, like these cut rate group insurance. No. I like to help them build a team and I'll give them, I have templates on, okay, so you're going to interview a financial advisor. Here are the questions I want you to ask them. Just so the client doesn't call up and start asking technical questions about the SECURE Act. Let's just have a conversation first, because if you can't have a conversation with an advisor, you're not going to have a relationship. And it doesn't matter what your investments look like if you never go to them, if you start getting RSUs or if you hit a financial rough patch because they're not your person. They need to be your person. So I spend a lot of time networking and a lot of time sourcing a lot of different financial advisors, realtors, insurance brokers, just to find the exact right fit for clients. We have a really high success rate. People are generally happy with the referrals. I love it. I'm impressed. I really am. And this is going to be a training video that we use in our own practice. I, uh, I'll send you a bill. Send me a bill. <laughs> That's right. Okay. I have, I have one final question and then I promise I will uh, let you get on with your evening. So you said that your one of your core values is social justice. Yes. And I love that you put that out there on your website and you were very upfront about all of these different social justice issues that matter to you. Um, your website makes you very personable. I love that you mentioned even Cards Against Humanity, um, one of my all-time favorite games. So we'll play sometime. Um, but beyond that, tell us a little bit about your, your not necessarily each individual social justice issue, but is that something you discuss with, with clients? How does that relate to the work that you do? And, and just tell us a little bit about what you're passionate about and why you talked about your social justice issues right there on your website for your clients sure. to see. Well, I believe that everybody is entitled to estate planning. The, the legal aid societies are starting to provide estate planning. Financial advisors are starting to understand that it is not the top of the financial pyramid. Estate planning is foundational. 
what if your spouse gets deported or detained and you don't have their durable power of attorney and the money is in their account? It's pretty basic, right? And during COVID, a lot of people really appreciated that language in my durable powers of attorney and also in the trust that an incapacity includes being detained, being deported, disappearing. Like people who look like me in Portland, disappeared by the federal government. These are real things that happen and we need to put real people in control. There's also been historically a lack of access to the judicial system. There is a fear of the judicial system. There are articles after articles after articles about how a lot of people of color don't want anything to do with lawyers or the system. And what happens is their wealth does not make it to the next generation. It is eaten up by probate fees. It is eaten up by the blatantly racist and classist tax code. And I think it is incumbent upon us who have become estate planning lawyers not to get fixated on all of the fun things, all the fun games around tax deferral and to really take a look at how we can actually help one family or one person take whatever it is that they have and get it into the hands of the person or people that they love the most. This is the best way that we can be of service. Here in San Francisco, I am just over the moon and I hope that we're the wave of your future because our assessor's office offers free or very low cost estate planning for people who live in low income neighborhoods. I've never heard of anything like this before and I am over the moon and I am on all the neighborhood and mom sites saying you can get it done for free. Look, come to my workshop. I do workshops all the time. Come and learn from me so that you're really ready and then go and do this for free with a great lawyer at the Legal Aid Society. It's gonna be amazing. And um, the feedback has just been terrific. So it makes me happy. That's, That's for fantastic. everyone. It's for everybody. I love it. I love it. Is there anything we didn't cover today? I, I feel like I got to say a lot of fun things. I yeah. loved it. I, I loved it. I thought I thought it was great. If, are there any other questions that you have for Patricia, Stan? No, I will say you inspire me, though, and I appreciate this time. Thank you so much. So I love being a podcast guest. I'm published in the Wealth Council Estate Planning Strategies book. I won an award for ethics from the Better Business Bureau and for you lawyers listening. They made fun of me because they said I was the only lawyer who ever won it. So I <laughs> almost hit them in the head with the prize, but it was all virtual, so I didn't get to. And um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this. And I like talking to other lawyers about this and I like doing workshops. So anytime I can provide education or inspiration, I'm here. I love what we do. Terrific. Thank Fantastic. you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. This has been the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today was Patricia DeFonte, and you can find out more information about Patricia and the work that she does on her website, and we will link that in the show notes. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast with Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. If you enjoyed the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To find out more about Stan and Katie Beth, go to PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. You can also find links in the show notes.